If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. The Sending out good vibes. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Hey guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. Coming at you this week with friend of the show, Ben Van Kirkwick from the Uncharted X program on YouTube. Of course, you know, a lot of things happened since the last time we had Ben on the show. He's been on Joe Rogan. We went to Egypt with him. Down in Montana, I was hanging out with him down there, seen a lot of jamming. And, uh, you know, just became, I guess, um, really just a lot better friends. Along the way, because that time we had really, you know, we had talked to him a few times, but up until um, cause at that time, we had really only hung out with him at the one Scablands event. We sort of met him, made plans, and then we had him on the show right away. And then we went to Egypt together, and hung on Montana, hung out on a few few trips now. So, yeah. It's yeah it's, he's great. It's been great. It's just so good to see him doing all this, this amazing work, especially with, uh, I don't know with these new vases and stuff and get a little deeper into communicating this technology to people. He's doing a really good job at like the communication part, you know, his, his videos, I guess he writes his, his work too, like his videos, but they're really well done. Yeah. It's great. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's neat to see like him and the bros and other, like, I think even that, I forget his name now, but there's just a few guys that, you know, I almost consider colleagues that are really moving to the forefront of some of these different avenues of research. Like, you know, in our lifetime, Ben will be like the go-to Egypt guy for some of this stuff. You know what I mean? Him and yeah, him yeah, yeah. So it's humbling. Sort of stepping into like what are you saying, like Jonathan John Anthony West shoes kind of thing, like because he is yeah. the guy, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Him and maybe, you know, even Eric Von Daniken, guys like that, that were the first yeah. guys in there being like, now nah, you guys are fucking nuts. If you think yeah. this is what happened. And it's so weird to see these, like, to me, I keep coming back to these granite boxes, whether that's like Serapium type boxes or the boxes that we found, you know, that we, that are sitting on Elephantine Island or in other places that just nobody's, there's just no mainstream explanation really for them. There's just nothing. Everybody accepts that they're ancient, but nobody really wants to talk about how they were made. So there's, just, it's really weird just to see that stuff in person, and then, you know, have people like Ben to really explain it to the world. Yeah, it is. It's something else. It's, uh, I mean, going to Egypt with that, with uh, with Ben, will turn out to be one of those things. You know, one of those once in a lifetime, or well, hopefully not once in a lifetime, I and mean, with a little luck. We'll get to do it uh, more than once, but you know what I mean, like yeah, yeah. You could that was this wasn't a possibility twenty years ago. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. You know, there's no one was really the infrastructure. The internet wasn't old enough for the infrastructure to be in place, for the relationships to be in place to just like go to Egypt and check. maybe it was, and I'm just naive about that. But like you went there, was it didn't seem like as much of an option to like. Where would you find the tour before the internet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't forget it was to the point where I could sneak onto the pyramid, like climb up it and smoke a doobie there. Like, and weed was like pretty, pretty looked down upon. So it's changed a lot in the last uh, 30, 35, 33 years, you know? On top of the Great Pyramid? Yeah, not on the top, top, but we we climbed up a bit, you know? You, that was back in the day when you could climb it. No one cares. Well, I think we had to be careful. I mean, I I can't remember if we paid somebody to watch out for us or if we just did it on our own, but, you know, you got to be careful. I can hear your phone. How close to the top did you get? 
Oh, not very, not very. Just we just went up a couple layers, like yeah. it's like three, like barely. Yeah, like two layers, layer. two or three layers, probably. It's like screwed up a couple of. Yeah, couple just, layers. To, just to say we did it, probably you know. So you smoked weed on. It'd be cool if you went to the top, and we could be like. One host smoked a joint on the pyramid and one host smoked weed <laughs> in the pyramid. Yeah, exactly. 25 years apart or whatever. And 33 years apart. 33? No. no 90, it was probably 32 years apart, I guess. What's going on with all this uh, no agenda social drama? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, this is the... Something? Do we have to do something? Well, you know what happened is... Um, well, did you hear it? Did you hear it? I was what? listening live and it's the, uh, we were going oh, okay. through the mountains, so it was cutting yeah. it out. It's the Mastodon instance, right? So what's happened is because it's been because he named it No Agenda and all that, and and it it's just that people anybody can post anything on there, and everybody in the whole uh, connected what do you call that universe of all the instances of the Mastodon, the the something verse, the Fediverse. Fediverse. The Fediverse, you know, Fediverse. everybody can see that. So I think what's happened is is there's a bunch of jerks just posting a bunch of sh- stupid stuff and it, it's kind of under the no agenda name, right? Because that's the way they named it. So wait, jerks like me? Uh yeah, probably. I mean, yeah. that, maybe maybe your uh, your memes would be considered that. I, no, I just think it's trolls too, right? It's not just like you're you're more more than a troll. You're oh, more of a you. meme lord than a troll, I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> wow. What an honor. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't post them in No Agenda. No, I, I can't. If I got a doozy, you know, but mostly if, if for No Agenda, agenda uh, chat, I'll just some promotional stuff here and there, but I didn't post a lot. So I need to, I'm just going to get deleted or I need to do something. No, or, I don't think you need to do anything, but... I can just I think, do nothing. I think they're just going to take, they've already made a new one. So people can, people that want to go to the new one, they can find a way to go to the new one. I don't know how to explain it. I'm not, you know, well, I don't, if I don't do that, then I'm out. Then you probably just get knocked out of the old one. The old one will get taken down. So I need to do something if I don't want to be just taken down. Yeah. If I want to continue to be part I of I just don't, game. I don't like that. I just don't like that, uh, that platform really. It just doesn't do it for me. It's, well, it's because you're hooked on X. True, X-X-X. true. I am now. Yeah, you're an ex at it. It's been six. I we should check. It's probably X-X-X. been exactly like six months Way since I've been gay. Does it say what? It's like a sex addict, but without any of the fun letters. So, June 2023 was when I joined. So, there's a lot of porn on X, so, and a lot of snuff. I heard I've seen a lot of uh people complaining about snuff. So, yeah, it's been six, uh, six years or six months. Six months and you're uh, fully immersed. Do you find fully immersion? How many hours a day you spend on on the X? Oh, no, just in the just, dude. It's just whenever I get to my computer to work, you know. And then the first thing in the morning, check the emails, go on there at night, try and go on there. I don't check it on my phone during the day. Rarely, sometimes I do, but if I'm looking for a message or trying to like communicate with somebody, but Did you I'll tell you what is weird. The phone. Like- the phone experience, once you use it on the desktop, the phone experience sucks because it repeats the stuff. They're, they have the something's wrong with the refreshing of your stuff. You just see the same old stuff that you looked at already on your desktop. So something's mm-hmm. going with the refresh rate. And there's problems with the desktop app as well. It's not 100%. I would say there's some glitches. Like when you click on to show more, it stops the video you're looking at and you have to replay it and stop, like, you know, redo it. So there's, I think it needs some work, but it's, but it's just, it's pretty good. There's people on there. What I appreciate on there is there's people on there that are now allowed to just talk about their, their uh, jab injuries and stuff like that. Right. Before you, they, they were not allowing Facebook was censoring people. There was all that censorship. Now it does seem like that's being allowed. At least I know people like you aren't allowed back on, but me. So the enemies of the state. Yeah. You're, you've got the Canadian government, uh, Probably. Same you think thing, it's the Canadian know. government? Yeah, totally. Interesting. You've been blacklisted by them, by, you know. Blacklisted. Yeah. That bad? You've been brownlisted by them. Brownlisted. You <laughs> racist piece of shit. How's the coast? 
What? Sunshine. How's the coast? Oh, it's it's okay. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. It warm up. Uh, it's warming up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Is it below zero? Uh, yeah. Just barely. So is it frozen? Is it icy? Yeah, it's not too bad. That's it's not, not too bad. Too bad. No. no like, it's okay. I mean, honestly, I've just been working. I haven't really sightseed or anything like that. I mean, just been just been working on the podcast and the books and this stuff down here. So I don't know. I'm probably going to be here for another week or two, maybe. Just some stuff and sausage. Yeah. Did you stuff sausage? Uh, no, I oh. packaged sausage. Like a uh, vacuum pack? Yeah. How many in a pack? Four. Oh, and then you have a bitch. He's got a quick machine. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Mine's like a few seconds. It starts to get old. You can catch up to it, you know, where you're like, yeah, right, right. Sausages are piling up because the machine yeah. can't keep up. Yeah. Huh. Well, now you'll have some training. So the next time I make sausage, I'll get you over here. So get you up. Yeah. Yeah. I can sausage. I mean, you seem like a sausage packer. Yeah. Thanks. I can see that. Yeah. Well, that's nice. It's uh, it warmed up here a little today. Started to, um, I think it's minus twenty, maybe minus twenty-two. That's 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 hand. That's uh, that's more doable. Like anything below twenty gets a bit weird, but minus twenty is okay. You can go out for a bit in your shorts and shovel some snow and stuff. It's not so bad. No, or you could just like dress like an adult and wear pants <laughs> and go out for the whole day. Yeah, you know. I've managed to get out every day for a bit. We don't get cooped up in the house. That's good. We'll do this and that. Yeah. And went and got water at the spring in the cold. Yeah. So my one shitty finger gets super cold. Now it's not working as well. I was really making some progress with it. And then I froze it a couple times. And now it uh, seems like. I guess because the blood, the blood has a problem getting down there or something. Yeah. So the freezing. Fucking Brandon Powell. He would have me believe that they should be good as new from that water. Yeah. You know, I yeah. froze it solid yesterday, like froze, froze. Cause you're in the water, it's minus 30. You're filling up. I had to fill up 15 fucking jugs of water, two trips. So yeah. it's like fill up fucking eight, drag them out. <laughs> fill up minus seven. 30. <laughs> yeah. Were they starting to freeze by the time you get home? Oh yeah, they're fucking. There's like a in like a half inch layer of ice and all. It was weird because they're all like wow. they're all kind of empty, but it's because there's like yeah, uh, I would say mm, another four hours and they would froze solid. Wow, that's crazy. That's fast, fast freezing. Well, it took two hours to get home, so that'd be like six hours. Yeah, it's two hours to the spring. And you know what? I was like, yeah, I could get used to the well water. It's not terrible. It's but nice to have the spring water, though. I have to get the spring water. It's so good, you know, to drink it again. It's just, it's, it is much better. It's noticeably better. So I told people after the last episode with uh, Jimmy Fritz, he was quite the skeptic, and I, I could not believe that he was like... <laughs> talking about James Randi and the skeptics and stuff. I was like, I was a bit blown away. And, um, and you know, what's funny is the ethical skeptic who we had on, it, he's like very familiar with that whole thing and what was going on with that. And he's coming out. We're the, our next episode after Ben's is, is with the ethical skeptic. And, uh, when I was doing some research on Randy, cause I wanted to talk about it a little bit. I'm like, cause this guy felt, I was like, what's going on? Like, is this guy like amazing Randy? Yeah, is this guy stuck in 2014 or something like that? So, so I just started. The, so wait, wait, wait. This is the million dollar guy, right? The yeah, guy yeah, yeah. Million yeah. bucks for yeah. anyone who could prove yeah. any paranormal anything. Oh yeah, it's yeah, it's called the prize, his prize, the amazing Randy. Yeah, it's, it's a prize, right? But he, but so, they, they so. sort of rig it. They, they kind of rig it, and it's just he's, he's been kind of known. He's caught. De being deceptive and deceiving people in order to show that people are deceiving people. Like they, they even made a movie called the, the honest lie, an honest liar. Like this is, this is how bad it was getting at that time. What's so I, of course I pulled up at like 20, the 2010s, basically like he, oh, the this skeptical. Now, what? Two years back, so like a decade ago. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Like, 
when we remember when we first started podcasting, that was all kind of coming to a head, right? In some ways, in some ways, he's why we we're podcasting because I was listening to the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. I mean, I started out in that sort of vein where I was looking at that kind of stuff, and they're just ridiculing anybody that had any kind of experience at all that wasn't explainable in their paradigm. And of course they were big Randy fans and they were, you know, supporting Randy. So I, then I went into like mysterious universe and then those guys, but that was back when Randy kind of got, he kind of got, got busted for some stuff. And then I, and of course I find, you know, skeptico, they, they've got Pedo? a huge threat. What? Is he a pedo? No, 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 nothing like that. <clears throat> That'd be cool. But there was something about uh, his, his, his friend, uh, I I don't even want to get into the details to be honest with you because there's just too much there's too much here but I just wanted to talk about a couple uh, there's skeptical about skeptics dot org which has got a whole a whole thing about James Randi on there he's got many many articles written on him you know about uh, they've got a video of of Rupert Sheldrake basically saying that how James is a liar when he goes and talks about his evidence that he's got, when you really find out later on, James doesn't have the evidence. There's a bunch of articles, the man who destroyed skepticism, James Randi's problem. They talk about his foundation, the prize, the skeptical challenge. Um, yeah. It's uh, his dishonest claims about dogs. Like he, he's basically been known as the guy that deceives to, to find the deceivers. So I guess there's a, philosophical question of whether that's like if that's good <laughs> well and then of course and then of course the ethical skeptic so that his his site came up which is interesting when i was searching this <clears throat> so this is uh this is back from 20 so this is going back to 2011 so this is like right around that time that i was talking about and all those articles from the other one are all from 2014 2013 2012 2011 like it it's this is when it was all happening, right? There's other stuff from member Steve Volk, the unstoppable, unstoppable woo of the fanaticist, the fantasist, James Randi, debunking the king of debunkers, skepticism's great Achilles, <clears throat> his disingenuous legacy. I mean, it, it, it sort of ended around that time. And then the ethical skeptic says uh, he's got a thing here. Anti-homeopathy -home propaganda proves false. So he heard the social skeptic cabal screaming about how all homeopathic medicines consist of only infinitesimally diluted placebo formulations. So I di decided to check out their assertions. What I found did not match what they claimed to me. So he's got a whole article on it too. So there's a lot of good work that's been done to show how disingenuous and what a joke that whole... That whole era was really that sort of summarizes that whole era. That's kind of when I feel like that that whole new atheist skeptical movement had this sort of nail in their coffin. Did you get in? A, I guess you didn't get the emergency alert. Oh my god! I want to talk about that on our, on our uh, outlawed roundup show. I mean, yeah. it's mind boggling. I've got some theories about it. Let's hear your theories. Well, I just, at first I was like, oh my God, this is like punishment to Daniel Smith for pushing back on all their green, green energy stuff. And then I thought, you know what? It's probably from Daniel Smith to wake everybody up because they're like this, you know, this is what, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, it sounds like a bit of a propaganda from, from her. I mean, I think, I think it would be worth, worth the, the pushback against Alberta having a shitty power system uh, just to wake people up saying like, if our power is this bad, like how are we going to do it with less fossil fuels and more like windmills and, and, and uh, solar panels that aren't doing anything like that. The, they were showing all the energy, like how it's spread out and what's supplying what, what percentage of the power. And it's just the green stuff is doing nothing. Right. So seem to be helping. Those were being pushed. That was being pushed around. I mean, I, I honestly, I honestly think it was just a, a way to show that to, to the larger crowd. Although it's also demeaning to yourself, then you're and you're out and your province that you even have to say that. But what if they didn't even need to? What if they didn't even need to? They're just putting it out there to say, hey, you guys, uh, 
calm down because we can't. What do you think? Well, I think there's probably they shut down. Of, uh, they fast track the shutdown of some plants back in the day. That's the coal wild. plants that were supposed to be converted to natural gas or something like that. Yeah, I don't well, think maybe that we should help in. I mean, I mean, everyone. There is the fact that there's more people in Alberta than there ever has been by probably ten percent. Almost right. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, maybe between five, at least five percent more people here this year. Even Maybe with that's all the a, dead people, so that's it. There's also the fact that look at all the shit, man. I mean, I am surrounded by shit right now that is just sucking power like a oh, motherfucker yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that nobody had even like 15 years ago. You know even what I mean? 10, 15 years five. ago, 15 years ago, there wasn't four phones fucking charging and an iPad and a TV in every room, and now everyone needs double monitors and there's probably three different laptops that need charging. So there's that, and the new people, and uh, well, and and, 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 add and in the electric cars. Yeah, how much power do you think it takes to charge an electric car? Well, let's just say what can you? Maybe you should for people for context. Maybe you should we should tell them what happened. So uh, there was a message that came out from, I guess, from Alberta Energy, whatever the consortium, or uh, it's because it's privatized, right? So who was it? Was it Daniel Smith herself? Like who put the message out? I don't know. Was it the Alberta government? So let's just say it's the Alberta government. I'm sure it was authorized by them either way. And it's That's just saying true. like, this is when it was really cold on the weekend. And they're saying, please limit your, your power usage to, and don't plug in your vehicles and don't plug in your, your vehicles that aren't EV. Like don't do your block, block charging or whatever. What do you call that? Block heating? Block heating. So all of a sudden they just, they just don't want vehicles <laughs> plugged in no matter what. Whether it's charging the battery or charging it to keep it hot. So, so how what, much power do you think it takes to charge a uh, electric car? Five thousand. What? Whatever's. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. How much do you think in relation to how much power your house is using in a day? Uh, I don't know. Double. No. Yeah. That's on the low end. Are you on sure? the low end. Yeah, the low end Teslas. Teslas start at 50 kilowatts. So that's the charge, one charge. I'm on, the average home in Canada, if you want to go average, the average home in Canada is burning 30 kilowatts a day. Charge your Tesla one time is 50. The cheapest, shittiest electric car you can get, the, the lowest uh, charge one. Which is a Tesla. So yeah, something like that. It's 35 kilowatts. So still more than your entire house will use in a day. Wow. That's interesting. If you have the higher end Tesla, up to a hundred kilowatt hours. So three houses. So for every electric car that's looking at two more houses that need power. And then what are the implications of everybody getting home from work at four o'clock and plugging that car in? Because now it's not if you got the good charger, it's like it's like six hours or whatever, you know? I don't know because I don't have a Tesla, but there's like, you can get the one that takes all night and you can get the one that is quicker. In the yeah, supercharger. It's not quite the supercharger, but... Because uh, that one's, it, that one's that the one that's... Too much. That's the one that's like 20 minutes. Yeah. So what happens when you put the same amount of power that it would take to power my house for three days and put it into 20 minutes? And, you know, maybe you got 100 of those going on at the same time as you have thirty or forty thousand electric cars that are trying to pile it, which is basically the equivalent of say, you know, a hundred thousand houses. But it's a hundred thousand houses crammed into six hours. So is that the equivalent of a half million? I know, but the 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 whole point of it is that they should be if they're pushing us to do this, which they are, twenty thirty five is when they don't want to sell any more gas cars. They should be building the infrastructure to support this stuff. Like they should, they, there has to be a plant. I mean, isn't this fucking engineering? Isn't this, uh, you know, civic, civic infrastructure and engineering that you're going to grow all your population by this much and you got to put in the infrastructure and you have to have the power and you do all that, you know? I don't know. The electric cars, I think, are a wild card. I don't think anybody really. 
because their main subsidizing push. it that's so their... much that but they're subsidizing it so much that they're saying that you can charge it for only an extra fifty dollars a month. They don't know what they're so they just it should be a, a it should be blind doubling, spot there. Should be doubling or tripling your home utility bill. I don't understand it. Maybe so. Yeah, I don't know. How are they how are they extracting that? I didn't cost believe it myself. So I had to Google this and Google that and fucking that's what they say. So are we gonna talk about it more in on Outlaw then? I'd like to. I have to, yeah, we can. We can. But I mean, there's a there's almost a there's probably between, you know, there's almost a hundred thousand electric cars in Alberta. No, <laughs> that's quite so, a bit. So you should that, see Vancouver. I mean, you should see Vancouver. It's it's crazy. If that's it's the equivalent, awful. if that's even the equivalent to double the houses, that's a hundred thousand houses. But it's crammed into that's a hundred thousand houses all plugging in after at night, not during the day. It's at well, it's night. Good thing we're short on houses, right? I mean, how it's how are not people hundred thousand houses because it's crammed into one time, so it's sped up, so it's speeding that day up. So it's yeah. it's more like three or four hundred thousand houses. You're talking about a seven called a seven percent population growth. And a fucking another ten percent of simulated population growth because of electric car charging. I know but this should all be getting into their stupid buses and shit like that. I know, but it should all be accounted for. I mean, this should all be part of the plan. Who the fuck is accounting for it? Who the people that run the place? I mean, what are they supposed to do? That's your fucking job. What do you think they're running the place? The what? The government, unfortunately. No. No. The corporations, I mean, well, this is, you know, this is getting to the crux of the problem, right? Elon's just weaseling in and throwing some shit up. He don't give a fuck about the power grid, man. No, I'm not talking about Elon. I'm not, it's not his responsibility. He weaseled the government into making people put in superchargers wherever they, whenever they, you know, how much of a power draw is it just to have that supercharger there available and ready to switch on? You know, is it zero? I don't think it's zero. Yeah. But every new fucking shopping center that goes up needs to have so many of these superchargers there available. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, they want to put it in a condos like in new Westminster. They want to put every, every one in every single lot, every car lot. Who's paying for that? We are through subsidies. Yeah, exactly. We're paying for that. It's just so gross. Cool. I was blowing some shit up again today. You should come blow some shit up on your way home. Are you yeah, maybe. flying right over? I don't know what I'm doing yet. Well, you ain't flying here and being stuck here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We have finally, you know, like perfected the Tannerite bomb, so. Nice. Yeah, we can get some pretty good fireballs going. <laughs> it's a good one. When it's summer, we're going to go out to the sand pit and like blow up some fridges and shit. <laughs> See if we can become a statistic. <laughs> Support the show, guys. GrandAmerica.ca slash support. If you like what we're up to around here, you're getting some value from it. You know, you can head over. It's not supposed to be free. We've put, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours into the episodes. Effort. Dollars. And uh, if you're getting some value from that, if you think it makes your life better in some way, is it a dollar better? Is it two dollars better? Herdogramerica.ca slash support. Send some value back our way. You know, they're going to get a bigger heat bill this month. Up here freezing in the great white north. So we could just use some more supporters. We get podcast subscriptions are the first thing to go as the economy goes to shit. So if you're in the position to sign up for even a buck a month, guys, at two bucks a month, we would be eternally grateful. Herdogramerica.ca slash support today. Sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation. Whatever floats your boat. Also, you can check out, we were talking about the roundups. Or it sounds like we'll tear down some electric cars. We did super spicy roundup extension last week. Uber spicy about ritualistic murder and shit. And uh, just another good show. It's GrandAmericaOutlaw.ca if you want to check that out. Um, you know, it's another free hour of content almost every week. Oh. The latest outlawed was two hours. Uh, I, guess ethical, I guess it's two hours a week. Free. The ethical skeptic, yeah, was was because we do one released. It was amazing and a, and a roundup. Yeah, the ethical skeptic was an amazing chat. It's there, and uh, the last roundup was great. You can check those out. Grammaricaoutlaw.ca. 
I mean, the, the, if you like the interviews, you'll like the roundups for sure. And there's adultbrain.ca if you want to check out the audiobooks, the audiobook podcast, a bunch of free audiobooks switching up all the time. Probably another week on these ones that are running and they will get switched up. So grab those ones up if you want to grab them. They'll get switched up to some new titles next week. Got some new titles came out. You guys can check out. I don't have them in front of me, but there's three books there at least that weren't there last month that you guys might want to check out. Do you want me to mention them right now? I can mention you them. Have them handy? Probably the Cabalion. No, no, it wasn't the Cabalion. It was nope. uh, the Divine Pymander. That's one. And uh, Fabianism and the Empire. That's a manifesto by the Fabian Society by Bernard Shaw. Pretty interesting book. And it's Caesar's manifesto. Column, right? That one is the, it. it's like a dystopian utopia novel by Ignatius Donnelly and a novel. It's kind of like steampunk in a way, too. It's really cool. There you have it. Adultbrain.ca, if you guys want to check out that, like it is, it's a podcast form. You don't have to buy those books. You can sign up as a podcast, listen to giant chunks of all of them for free, and uh, three free books every month that you can listen to in their entireties. Adultbrain.ca, check that out. And uh, contact at thecabin.com to get on the trips. The Scablines trip is going fast. We got the Eclipse trip coming up. That's going to be a blast. I mean, you really get on the Eclipse thing. It's 500 bucks. Come hang out with us. It's really not much. Come on down, and we will have a blast. You will not regret it. It is the time of all. It is one of the spectacles of a lifetime that less than 1% of people in the history of planet have got to experience. So get your ass down. Party off the eclipse with us. That's about it. You know, I, I don't think we got anything else. You got anything else? I just, uh, Ben, I just got a little bit of a description of Ben. He's... His channel is Uncharted X. He's a longtime student and fan of history. He spent a long time or a lot of time throughout his life traveling to photographing and filming ancient sites all around the world. And more recently, interviewing and talking to many of the leading researchers and authors, many of whom are working to uncover the true origins of the mysteries that is our past. He believes there's a a need for a high quality content that addresses the new science and new discoveries that should affect how we view the past and to examine the contradictions that are clearly evident on ancient sites and in our orthodox version of history. I will hope, he says, I hope you will join me on this journey. Please consider the value for value model as outlined at unchartedx slash support dot com slash support. There's a link in the show notes to all that. And yeah, he's uh, obviously you can hear the, uh, the no agenda ring in that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Check it out. I mean, Ben's doing great stuff over there. We got that Egypt trip coming on. You maybe you can sneak into that last minute and uh, check out some snake bros too. I heard they were creeping in on the live stream of this show with their live stream. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think that's all you got. You got anything else? That's it. Thanks. That's it, guys. Enjoy the chat with the fabulous Ben Van Kirkwood. Uh, well, we are live, Ben. Welcome back. It's good to see you again, Graham. Darren, mate, great to be back. Yeah, I've uh, I've been looking forward to this for a little while, actually. Happy yeah, to be yeah. back on the show. Me too. I mean, what exciting times! I mean, I, I'm watching your last few videos on the vases. Yeah. I mean, it's really quite interesting. I've seen the, some of the skeptics like pushing back on on X, like <laughs> yep. calling you a grifter, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah. I can't wait to talk to Ben about all this. See what he has to say about that. But yeah, yeah. it's. it's uh, 
really it's been, fascinating. It's been a it's been a big year for that. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. I mean, it was um, but it kind of took over my whole twenty twenty three. The the vase scan project was like this big thing that happened, and, and it was very validating for me personally. I mean, you know, Chris Dunn, who I'm I'm friends with, uh, oh, I should pimp his book actually. Um, yeah, his his new book that just came out, the Giza Power Plant. Oh, the Giza, yep. the Tesla connection, which is the follow up to Giza, the power plant just came out. Uh, but he was, yeah, he called me up and said, "Oh, his, his son is involved with these guys doing this vase scan project and wanted to talk to me." And I was like, "I'd really, I'd be down uh, anytime." So his son Alex calls me, and you know they'd been playing with this for a, a couple of years and they hadn't really gotten anywhere with it. They finally got it and analyzed, and they got to these results, and they're like, their minds were blown with what they saw. And then I think they were looking for an outlet for it, and it just so happened that it was. The timing was really good because I think it was the end of 22 and then I knew I was going on Rogan in 23, so I got to talk about it there a bit. And I wish I wish I knew as much about it now as I did then. But, yeah, it, it kind of took over the year and then it definitely rustled some jimmies, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just it's, uh, what I love about it is it's been happening fast, you know. It's finally like finally we've, we're seeing stuff happen fast and, yep. and it's nice to – Nice to see. It's not like five, 10 years down the road. I mean, I love how they described like you were in a parallel search on the vases yourself. And they're like, well, yeah. Ben's been interested in these vases too. Like let's, so that's, that's kind of interesting that you both came at it. From oh, different angles. It's, it, 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 it was literally the exact type of work that I had and me and many others, right. I'm not the yeah. only one that's, that's looking at these ancient artifacts. You, you guys were in Egypt with us a, a year or two ago and, and you can see, like, there's a, there's two categories of artifacts, right? There's stuff that, okay, yep, yeah, that's handmade. But then there's other stuff. You, it's like, how do you explain this with these, yeah. you know, rock, you know, like pounding stones and and you know, um, and stone chisels and things. And a lot of people are like, we should be applying our technology and our own metrology and our capabilities to try and investigate the engineering that's behind these things. And I've been saying that for years. And then. Lo and behold, these guys have actually done it. Actual met- metrologists and experts have done it. They've scanned it with these super high resolution you know um uh structured light scanners and then later with ct x-ray scanners which give you even better resolution and then they're they're we've got professionals actually analyzing the results and that it's just kind of mind-bending precision that's coming out of these things and anyone who's a machinist or an engineer they all get it kind of immediately and they're like this is there's no way this stuff is is kind of made by some dude rubbing on it with rock and sand and water and banging on it with sticks which is how they're explained but yeah, it was it was super validating for me. I was really really happy that they they contacted me. I mean, I would have been reporting on it none regardless if I was the guy that kind of they came to 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 talk about it and um and put it out there on the internet. And it definitely it garnered a fair bit of attention. I mean, it's it's I, I'm it's it's ongoing. That the work is continuing and it is going in the right direction. I think with we're now there is a efforts underway and it's been going on for like six months where we're working with some Egyptian um, universities who have access to museums in Egypt, which we really want those guys. And there's engineers involved in it as well as Egyptologists from these academic institu- institutions who are, who are, you know, it's a slow, I mean, this, the ball rolls slowly in, in Egypt, but we are working on like, you know, they've been scanning stuff with LIDAR for, 3d kind of virtual galleries and things but they that we are going to get the, their hands on some structured light scanning equipment so we can go into museums and scan some of these vases with you know this like impeccable provenance i mean provenance has been the the, the one the 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 major objection to what the findings that have come out of this vase ban, vase scan project and the thing that people always seem to get when they you know knickers in a knot about is that they they're calling them modern fakes now I, I don't think they're fakes at all. I, I think that, that we address the provenance issue. It takes, you know, you, you've got to dive into it a little bit and explain kind of the origin of these things, how the antiquities market works for private collectors versus the stuff that's in museums, establish history. I mean, this a lot of these things have history going back to the 1800s or early 1900s. Uh, if And then some of them go back to the 1960s, some of them go back to the 1980s. And you know, honestly, we, we barely, I, I would... I would say it was challenging for us to have even the capability to produce artifacts like this with that level of precision in the 60s or 80s. That's what I was going to say. When would be that? Like, when is that that sort of turning point when we could do that with a CNC machine with, yeah. with you know, like if you had the, if you had it in a computer program, which is designing it is, is another thing altogether because it's following all these crazy 
the yeah. formulas, but um, well, when would we be able to do that? Eighties, like late eighties, I mean, early nineties. Yeah, somewhere around there. I look. I, it's like we could. We had precision lathes, you know, in the sixties and eighties, and they're still like people still use the equipment, like the big machines that are, were produced in like Sweden and Switzerland or whatever, and Austria in, in during those times. They're still used today because they can produce precision. But these things weren't just made on a lathe. That's, like that's, that's the other I mean. element yeah, of yeah, it. It's yeah, like that. You can't make them just on a lathe. They have to be milled. And then if you analyze the precision, when you look at like, okay, these, you know, these vases have these lug handles. In fact, I've got, here's an example, you know, so I've got, you know, you have the vase like this and obviously you can, you can imagine that if you take away the lug handles, you can kind of imagine it being rotated and made, but you have these lug handles that are on it. They're not like glued on. They're part of the stone. And so when you're lathing this thing, say this way, down its axes and you're creating that circular shape, you have to leave this bull nose yeah, that sits out yeah. around the whole width of the of the vase and then come back later with another process and, and essentially cut all that material away and leaving yeah. the lug handles that you then yeah. can drill through or whatever. But, and it has to be matching perfectly with the radius of the well, other one. And I mean, that's the... Yeah, so by analyzing the, the area of the vase body in between the lug handles, the stuff yeah. that had to be removed by yeah. a different process... You can you can compare the precision of that area and the the lug handles themselves to the precision on the rest of the vase, and and that should tell you, okay, was it a different process? Do we see a different level of precision here? Because I can tell you, in our in our if we were to do this in a multi step process today with our machines, this is one of the crazy things about this is that if you say you lathe the body and you left that bull yeah. nose, you came back with yeah. a different process, you yeah. would see that that That's reflected the in the precision. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's a different tooling process, it's a different machine, and you lose that positional calibration that you're talking about, like thousands of an inch or, or yep. you know, or or microns or whatever. Um, or, and and the other option that how we'd make this today, we might make something like today's, is in what you basically a single pass, a single machine, which you then need five axes of freedom to do, aka a five axis mill, a like one of those machine, robot like guided mill, things, yeah. yeah. And when we analyze this, and we've analyzed several of these vases now, uh, we don't see any appreciable lack of precision in those areas. So you have you have two conclusions you can draw from that. It's either one is that they were able to do a multi-step process, including like dealing with that lack of positional calibration when you do that process change and handle it better than we can. Or they were made on a machine that had five axes of freedom and could do it in a single pass or with a single tooltip. Which is which is you know that's a five axis mill. That's how we do that. That's how we do that today, and that's you know e either way. Even the lathe concept is is people. Well, well, okay. The ancient Egyptians had lathes. Like this is nonsense. It's yeah. We're not talking about some wooden construction that guys like pushing on a pedal to spin it like it's a like a spinning yarn or something. It's a, it's a precision lathe to get the 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 just the the raw precision that we see on the surfaces of these vases. From a lathe, you have to have a precision lathe, which has to be massive and solid, made from metal. It has to have precision ball screws and rods and bearings and all these things. You know, you need it takes you need that machine to needs to be to that precision, right? Yeah, you you, to, you have to keep improving. Yeah, it it has to be more precise than what it's producing. In the same way, you measure stuff, right? You want you want your measuring device if it's measuring something has to be more accurate. Uh, like almost an order of magnitude more accurate than the thing you're measuring. Otherwise, you don't know what you're measuring same thing goes for manufacturing if you're if you're trying to hit a particular precision target the thing that's making that precision has to be by kind of definition more precise than what it's making so yeah even if the even if you go oh this made on lathe okay it, it's a significantly advanced and precision uh lathe so yeah it's it's the data is hard to deal with and that's what i found with the response to the vase work um People weren't really attacking the data at all. Uh, it's mostly been attacked, trying to attack the provenance, the motives of the people. I mean, I, like I said, <laughs> you mentioned, I get called a grifter and a scammer, all this sort of nonsense. Par for the well, course. At least not a white supremacist yet. Uh, mean, not yet. Although I did occasionally in the comments, it's like, yeah, you're just like weirdo comments come out <laughs> along when, those lines. But the grifter thing cracks me up. I just, I just, yeah. I, I talked about it with Kyle on a podcast the other day. It's like, I don't, I mean, Granted, we're talking about very ancient history, right? We're talking about periods of time, thousands of years ago. It's it's a murky environment, right? We, you can probably argue from whatever side of the fence you're on that there's lots of ways to maybe interpret 
what little data we have and what evidence we have. What what cracks me up about I thought about this is like people that call you a, a grifter, you're scamming. It's it's like you are those people must be so convinced that they're right, that they're correct, that the only other explanation in their head for somebody with an with a different perspective, a different opinion, they must be lying. They must be deliberately lying and scamming. And they, because they know the truth, because I'm, I'm correct. Like I'm, my, uh, my opinion is so correct. It's just, I think it's quite telling about their worldview, about their perspective on things. Uh, when you get called that sort of stuff, particularly in a field like this, I mean, if it's like yeah. someone's telling you two plus two is five, okay, you know, demonstrably yeah. you might not be telling the truth. But when it comes to these sort of topics, I mean, there's yeah. lots of room for alternative opinions. I don't. Yeah. You know, and I can understand a lot of the evidence that the people make for the mainstream cases in this stuff. And I'm not saying they're deliberately lying or anything like this. I think they just, there might be some selective, yeah. um, you know, selective importance put on different bits of evidence and things like that and some ignorance of other things. But, you know, I, I try to take a scientific approach and, and try to encompass all of the evidence, which includes other fields of science, you know, the 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 catastrophism that comes to us that from from recent science with the younger drives the extension of the human timeline the genetics that that are coming out everything's getting older and older humans human species included we're understanding more about the planet and what's happened in the past all, all the of other these stuff things. you're finding all the other stuff you're finding in Egypt that kind of match this theory in a way yeah. like the the old megalithic stuff the massive granite statues like yeah all that all that stuff yeah and look if if I, and I've said this before, and I, I stick to it. It's look if if at the end of the day, if we apply ourselves and apply our technology, and we do and we investigate this to the best of our capabilities, and at the end of the day, the result is I get proved wrong. Fine, like I, I I'll take that in terms of getting closer to the truth. Yeah. But what tends to happen, and this is the unfortunate, I think, reality of a lot of like just entrenched academia and it, entrenched kind of authoritative mainstream um opinions in a lot of academic fields is certainly by no means re- you know just restricted to archaeology but a lot of these guys are very it becomes very defensive i mean that just the very nature of establishment is to resist change yeah. and that's what happens so anything that comes up the challenges kind of the thing that you're considered to be the expert in and in, when it comes to you know the early parts of human civilization like you're literally telling a story you, you're le- you're weaving together this loose and disparate sets of evidence that we have and you're creating a narrative based on that and saying this is what happened and there's lots of ways to interpret that evidence and i think you need to account for all of the evidence and you know they just don't i mean there's just this is why the the younger dryas impact hypothesis gets you know there's a climate mafia in place in 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 the geological kind of world you know boss boslaw and hoops and these guys that just hate that idea cuz it's it's upsetting the apple cart um, you know, they don't acknowledge or even want to talk about the genetic studies, the DNA studies, the studies on teeth morphology. They they go Beckley Tepe when that came out as well. We'll just change the we'll change the definition of hunter gatherers to include building megalithic structures on the weekends, <laughs> you know, rather than changing the date of civilization. <laughs> and you know, Gunan Padang, another one, Indonesia. This came out in October this year. I'm I'm making a video on it now. You know, finally, Danny Hillman Natawajaja, who's been investigating that site. I mean, a decade ago, these are the results from him, but he dates that thing back to like 27,000 years ago and it's faced nothing but scorn and derision. I mean, it should be a, it should be an opportunity for archaeologists to go in there and explore further and say, well, okay, yeah. these are interesting results. Maybe we'll go in and we'll actually do some excavations and get down and try and figure it out. But no, no, it's just they just attack him, get him off the site, deride it. I mean, it's just I don't, I don't like the approach. Well, just to finish off this modern fake part, so when, when was the first five-axis machine sort of like – in production, I, mean, I, I really don't know. I've still, got to imagine it's eighties, like yeah, seventies, yeah. eighties, maybe. I might, yeah. I'm probably wrong. I'm sure there's someone's going to yell at me in the comments about no, it. No, 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 no. But I mean, that's what I would say. It's like the last few decades of you know, well, it's computerized, last, right? So once yeah. you get to that yeah. point, I mean, a lot of these lathes are manually operated, like they're semi-computerized, or they they yeah. have, you know, they're very meticulously machined, where it's a lot of hand-driven stuff, and then you start to get to that computerized age. Well, you've got you know computers are doing everything at a high level. Um, yeah, I got us. I would I would guess it was somewhere in that in that range. I don't know. I mean, it, look, the Egyptians eventually developed lathes and spinning tools as well, but it wasn't until kind of fifteen hundred, I think BC or thereabouts, like well and truly, 
um, thousands of years after the civilization started and thousands of years after the dates, which these things are attributed to, which is all like old kingdom, early yeah. days, pre-dynastic times before the civilization even started. So, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, the, look, provenance of these vases is tough too. Some of them have established provenance and, and, and certainly the collectors that we've been working with that are part of this uh, who have been acquiring vases. Some of them have really good provenance and some some of these vases have been on display in museums and they have, you know, that we know when they were taken out of Egypt legitimately in a lot of cases. You know, these things are given as gifts to foreign diplomats and governors and, you know, ambassadors and things. This happened, this is a standard practice from the 1800s, continued for a long time. I'm sure some of them probably came out of Egypt less legitimately. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, whenever someone's gone in there, they've taken stuff. I mean, this this has been levied at all of the early explorers, you know, uh, Howard Vice, Flinders Petrie. These guys would take stuff from the sites when they're excavating. And, you know, there's guys out there. I mean, this is something that I actually credit Zahir Was with is he is campaigning to get Egyptian artifacts back to Egypt. My personal opinion is I don't I don't really care where they are as long as they're on display in a museum where people can see them and they're not locked up in a basement. Um. That's it's fine. I, th- I think they've got more stuff in Egypt than they could ever hope to display in all the museum space they have there. Uh, but yeah, it's that's that's the nature of it with with provenance. Um, some well, of them, is- some of them have great provenance. Some of them have less great provenance. But it's still, I think, as you said, like there's the precision and there's the lay the kind of the technology issue. Even if they, if we know they have histories going back to the 80s or 60s, and then you have the design side, which you mentioned as well, because we've been we the team found just these remarkable, just remarkable design principles behind them based on sacred geometry, pi, phi, golden ratios, these, you know, fixed, this this crazy feature that we found on multiple vases now where all of the curvatures, the little tiny curvatures with circles with radii as small as a millimeter or 1.1 millimeter up to about 15 or 20 millimeters, if you look at all of those curvatures, they those the actual curvatures, those circles have a mathematical relationship with each other. It's not just random. They're not like randomly shaped curves. They're there are curvatures that can be expressed as these as orders of a specific algorithm uh, called the the radial traversal pattern. Um, yeah, and stuff like that. And before before can, we get too deep into that, can yeah, we just sorry. finish off the other thing? Like. <laughs> What's the chances of us finding a new un like undug up tomb or whatever something where they like the, there should be tons of these things also st- still around right I mean there's so much to be to be ex- um, to be found and explored right Yeah I I mean I, even the you know archaeologists will tell you and Egyptologists will tell you that uh, you know it's like something like eighty percent of the treasures of Egypt are probably still beneath the sands. That's that's the figure people give. So so the chances of actually finding something that um that is you know is is fresh and un, un untouched. I mean that's that's still fairly low because the problem is a lot of the stuff even when they find something new, it's it, it, quite often it's been robbed or taken apart in antiquity. You, you know, ancient tomb robbers. A lot of the times, I think it's the guys that built things that maybe went in afterwards and took stuff. You know, you have a couple cases of of un you know undisturbed tombs or 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 discoveries made. Tutankhamun's obviously the most famous. There was even there was a bigger and better find made at, at Tanis. Um, unfortunately, it coincided with the outbreak, I think, of World War II, so it kind of got overshadowed. But that's a, the Tanis collection is absolutely incredible. So, you know, occasionally they find stuff like that. I hope they find something else like that. that most of the tombs they find that are un, unopened and you know, fresh, a very much more recent, you know, the kind of New Kingdom, Ptolemaic era of shallow graves, you know, wooden boxes, mummies, they're looking for that stuff. Uh, the types of things where we find these sort of old kingdom artifacts on these right. old kingdom sites, at you know, deeper, bigger constructions, a lot of those have been explored. That's not to say there might not be more of these out there, but, yeah, I mean, there's tens and tens of thousands of these vases already discovered. I mean, fragments of them, they're not all whole, but vases and plates and dishes and stuff made from hard stone. Um, a lot of that, I think, in my opinion, got collected by the early pharaohs of the old kingdom, guys like Joza. Uh, it's his step pyramid under which, you know, forty to 50,000 of these artifacts were found. I think he was collecting them from uh, other tombs and other burials. He probably had his people out looking for it. I mean, that we know that a lot of them, 
even even the mainstream admits that okay, the stuff that's in Joe's, uh, the, the the chambers beneath the step pyramid. Uh, you know that stuff. A lot of it comes from earlier dynasties, earlier times. They're like, like they actually call them inherited heirlooms, which I think is a, a, a crazy acknowledgement for them to make because I think that explains a lot of stuff um, that we find in Egypt. But mostly, it just gets oh look, it's found in this guy's tomb. He built it. Yeah, that's the that's what were they done. broken already then, or was that like a new thing, or was that like some crazy jihad shit, or like what happened there? They were found broken. So a guy named Jean-Philippe Loyer was um, the man who, a French archaeologist or Egyptologist who excavated the Step Pyramid, I believe early 1900s, I want to say 1910 to 1920, somewhere in that range, maybe a little later. He's the guy who excavated uh, the Step Pyramid and found everything. You can go back and find pictures of what he found. And, yeah, a lot of stuff was already smashed up and broken. It had, it had evidently been robbed. But people weren't looking for these stone vases. I think they were looking for gold and gems and valuable things, and they probably smashed a lot of these vases and dishes to, just to quickly try and see if there's stuff in them that they can take. It definitely looked like it had been smashed up, but amongst all of those, there was still a lot that were, were, were whole. What, what, uh, what, what do you wish you knew when you went on to Rogan then? What, what kinds of things do you think you uh, I I had, didn't had have – Well, I didn't have the um, – the full appreciation for, I think, the mathematics behind the design of the vase. The radial because traversal for, pattern and all that? Yeah. So actually explaining that radial traversal pattern, not only that, but but the incorporation of pi and phi um, in the design of the vase. So it's- Yeah, you know, that you, would have been, that would have astounded him, I think. I think know. I talk a bit about it. I knew it was there, but I, I couldn't talk through it like I, I can now where there's like, it's literally- there's like a double equivalence in here between the radius. It's like this. This is on this actual vase. So this is the print of the original granite vase, like life. Can people buy those? Can people buy? Uh, Does anybody sell them? Are, I, you so the print- are you grifting the sales of those yet? <laughs> see, I should be. I'm not a very good grifter. You see, I don't. I don't sell them. Um, but I, the prints. If people want the STL files to print themselves, they are available on my website. Darren, Darren you got a oh, yeah. print. And I'll print and, one. I'll print and, you one, Graham, and I'll put okay. some. Crazy shit in there too, like uh, I don't know, like break in case of emergency. With a Just couple of you put do some, that. You know what? Put some <laughs> blood in there, and and the sacred geometry will purify the blood. I'm so putting an eight. I'm putting an eighth of mushrooms in there, and you can break <laughs> in one day. You know, in case of emergency, break. That's my theory. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I I do believe Matt Beale, who's the the owner for like a lot of the other vases, um, not not this particular OG vase, but he is. I think he is starting up a business where he will be selling prints of them. Um. But this 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 one is uh, I mean I've got I got four or five I think of the STLs on my side I I, I have a lot more STLs uh, I that I have from the scans that we've done and and you know I'm kind of work I I don't they're not my kind of it's not my data so I'm I work in with the vase owners to say hey is it okay if I release these when we talk about them so I've you know I put them out there but people can print them. Uh, and a lot of people have. In fact, I was given this by um, they kind of. This is actually a cleaned up version. It doesn't show the damage that's on the original vase. But yeah, it's it's you know there's 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 multiple ways of expressing pi and phi in the radius of the opening, the radius of the lip, the radius of the foot, and you can, there's a double equivalency across them. And it's such that there's one particular measurement. The, I think it's the radius of the opening, which can be expressed in terms of both pi and phi. And then using so Mark. Um, uh, what's his name? God, at the unsigned.io, Mark Vist, uh, is this uh, cryptographer who who did a lot of the analysis. He put hundreds of hours of analysis into the mathematical model, and he kind of took it to a whole other level of of understanding what was the design philosophy behind it and just how precise these were. But he once he found that double equivalency of this particular measurement, he then said, "Okay, so let's take let's take that measurement. I think it's the radius of the of the of the opening." Let's take that as the base unit, and, and as the let's assume that's a base unit of design in this principle. And that now we'll look at the other measurements on the vase, and by doing that, it shows that okay, you can express the other measurements, so the radius or the diameter of the opening, the radius of the foot, all these other measurements, you can express them in terms of pi and phi. So it might be phi squared, or it might just be pi base units, or phi squared base units. So it's like this: you're uncovering this. This, these significant ratios that are reflecting kind of cosmic knowledge in a lot of ways, right? Like, like geometrically, pi is geometric knowledge. Like that's 
Pi was never supposed to have been understood or invented back in 5,000 years ago when these things, I think they're older, but let's say 5,000 years. And then the golden ratio is is kind of the, it's like this universal constant, right? It, it, it's embedded in literally everything, life from bacteria and DNA molecules up to the formation of galaxies, you you see the golden ratio. Crop circle. In, crop circle, all of that stuff, right? It's reflected in as a, it's just like a universal constant that's all part of it. It's not an accident that we see it reflected in these vases intricately. Like it's, it's actually, you can express, you can express p- some measurements of this as phi ratios or, or pi ratios of another measurement on it. Like that's, that's crazy. And it's just, it's not, possible that you, this degree of mathematical interrelationships when you add in things like the radial traversal pattern the fact that all the other curvatures are related to each other with and can be expressed uh, in a single algorithm uh, that's not an accident right so it was no, actually nobody's making designed that in modern stuff right nobody's making these things like no. looking at anything except for just hey how i want to make a small cup with yep. a, with an oval shape like yeah. it stands up and doesn't fall over. Like I don't think any modern stuff is being made. It's no, sacred, sacredly like that. Not, not with that degree of design. No. So you might. So be, given that the golden ratio is essentially the proportions of nature, right? It's, it's if you, uh, you do see it in stuff like you see sculptures and in artwork, like the, you know, it's the, it's the ratio oh, yeah. of like the upper arm to the lower arm. It's just like it's if things look right, they're likely to show you the golden ratio just in simple ratios. Yeah, and that's the and argument. You, people say, I mean, it's it's. Been, I yeah. know it's been put in all that, but I mean, I'm talking about real modern stuff. That's just. Well, I mean, if it looks if it looks proportional and correct, we're probably looking at it as a golden ratio. But there's it's a much deeper level of integration into in in these vases. Like it's you have to, you know, it's not just a simple like oh the golden ratio is here. It's well no, there's you actually a, a cre- you de- de- defining or deriving a base unit of measurement, and then it's a it's a ratio of the it's it's like golden ratio times that that measurement or it might be golden ratio squared or something like this. It's not, yeah. it's not visibly obvious. Like the golden ratio might be in a yeah, well-constructed yeah, yeah. stool. Yeah. It's, and, but that's the argument people go, Oh, the golden ratio and everything. Well, that's, that's just, you're, you're misrepresenting the argument. You're misrepresenting the data and, and what's been found in these, in these vases. It's, it's far more complex and interrelated than that. It, it simply can't be an accident that that level of design is incorporated in this. And, and you're right. We don't design things like that these days. That's a, you know, that's. Like I'd love, and I know you guys are doing this, but I'd love to, because you guys have sort of made this, this program that can co- uh, go back and sort of reverse engineer like a, a vase and match it to the sort of those algorithms and see if it fits. Right. I mean, I'd love to see some mm-hmm. modern numbers and say, well, no, this doesn't fit. Like maybe in this one portion of it, it kind of matches a little bit, but the whole thing's not going to match. And then probably talk about the accuracy too. I mean, I love the video where you guys were in that machine shop and you're looking oh, for, yeah. and they make aircraft parts and they know exactly. And you can see these guys measuring oh. it, that they're shocked, right? These yep. are like within one thousand thousandths of an inch, two yep. thousandths of an inch and yep. concentric and, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. So when you made roundness, uh, concentricity, um, you know, surface consistency, these types of things we, we were measuring, and yeah, we're talking about some of these vases. You're talking one to two thousandths of an inch, maybe up to ten. I mean, these are degrees of precision that are really only shot for and achieved when you're in in, in industries like the aerospace industry, where you're making like you know turbine blades for jet engines, which is exactly, by the way, what these guys do. Yeah. Uh, and and the the engineers at Danville Metal Stamping, I mean, they're making aerospace parts, and they're just they're blown away. I mean, they they just understand it because it's like, well, you know, it's just like, well, could you make this vase for five thousand dollars or whatever? They're like, get out of town, like, let's just forget about it. You you couldn't particularly also. I mean, let's not forget it's made from granite, uh, a much harder medium and and tougher to work in medium than homogeneous steel or alloys or whatever. Uh, yeah, they they get it straight away, as do most machinists. Certainly, looking at the commentary and the emails that I get, I mean, machinists and engineers they get it. It's it's the people that don't like the conclusions and they don't like the results that are the ones that are objecting to it. And none of them have any background or knowledge or anything like that when it comes to precision manufacturing. They know nothing about what they're talking about. And Chris Dunn, I know, is currently in the process of tearing them a new asshole, I believe, which is going to be interesting who, who, when that who? comes out. Chris Dunn. Who who who's he tearing? Well, the, the skeptics of this work. Oh, like, the skeptic, like a lot of this. The, the, there's oh. been a bunch of videos and commentary made about a lot of this work, and it just comes from these people that generally have no idea what they're talking about, and they're just yeah. poo pooing the provenance and they're poo pooing the the accuracy and uh, yeah. all this sort of stuff. And it's just not it. It's tough to 
you know, it's it's you, it's tough to argue with the data, but but. I think there's some people trying. I mean, but they're welcome. That's that's one of the reasons we open source the models. It's like, hey, you don't believe it? Go, here's the model. Go and do the calculations yourself. Like all of, you know, all of all of Mark's data is available too. I mean, this is the crazy thing about this. Like, remember I said that you you can represent this vase as a series of mathematical equations based on the the, <laughs> the significant ratios and the the radial traversal pattern. So, Mark, I love this part, and this is another thing I would have loved to really explain on Rogan. Uh, but he may he said, "All right, so we've derived this algorithm. So let's make it in go into CAD and make a vase based purely on this algorithm. So let's make a perfect vase, only based on this mathematical algorithm that we've derived from the original vase. And then we'll take the scan of the original vase and we'll compare it to the model we've created purely from the mass, and we'll compare them. And the mean radial deviation between the construct like the scan of the original and the model was something like six microns which is wow a, a single micron is about the width of a bacteria right so it's pretty well, what's, damn what's small. That in, go back to imperial what's that in thousand? okay so so there's about 24 25 uh microns in a thousandth of an inch so you're so it's a tenth so of a thou kind of thing it's it, like, well it's, it's yeah guess, it's, it's like maybe two of, tenths one fifth of one thousandth of an inch and a human hair is Holy between shit. two Two and three thousandths thick. Yeah. Which is let's yeah, say it's I mean, fifty to seventy five yeah, micro. We used to reclaim aircraft parts, like the, the department that I that I ran in the in the late nineties, early two thousands, like we would things would be out by a few thou and we'd have to reclaim them. Like mm-hmm. sp- spray them, machine them down, spray them, grind them, get it back to like within one or two thou. Like that's the yeah, you know, that's that's lower than t- tolerances. Yeah. You know, the so tolerances the tolerances were like one or two thou sometimes, you know. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. That it's 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 a when you're working in thou, I mean, that's you know engine parts and the operating surfaces and engine parts. You might be three, four thou that type of thing. A lot of the other engine parts might be twenty or thirty thou if they're if they're not like function like super functional and depend on it. And you don't you don't manufacture everything to that level of precision if you don't need to because it's very expensive to do it. But yeah, the fact that the mathematical model and the real model differ by like a radio uh, av- it's the median radial. Different. So the, the the it's this is the difference in the radius of the curvatures between those models is around you know one which is really not what I mean that inch. even that you can't even it's not even that's not even it's not even out of tolerance if you were to make no. a top big so it, it, it's, it's yeah, pretty it's much you can almost spec. say it's exact same I mean yeah it's within well at that point uh, honestly at that point we we don't we don't know if we're actually dealing with. Um, you know, like deviations in the in the object itself, or in uh, inaccuracies in the scan, because you you're basically yeah. at the resolution of the yeah. scan. That, that, so we're like, we yeah. don't know. We're at that that level of error where where we're 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 testing the boundary of the accuracy of the actual thing we use to measure it. Yeah. So that's what's become interesting about <laughs> scanning so some fast. of these things. Well, now we've scanned them with CT X rays, which generate these scan files that are gigabytes in size, but you get down to like a micron level of resolution as opposed to like half a half a thou which is you know 12 13 micron so you're an order of magnitude more accurate with your scans now that we're, we're looking at which you and shouldn't I, can even, t- I mean you shouldn't even need to go any more accurate than a cmm <laughs> machine i mean measuring within a right. couple thou should be fine for everybody you know um yeah yeah it's it's it, look it's crazy i i i, I think we can handle the objections <laughs> that that are coming up and as people aren't really arguing with the data I can tell you this. I can. T- it's a, this work hasn't stopped. I mean, I, I'm. I haven't published everything that's been going on. I can. I can. I can probably safely say this: that that there's been a new vase acquired that is probably the most accurate one that we've seen so far. Even more accurate than the ones that we've seen. It's very. It's in the same ballpark, but but like it's average. This thing's average deviation is between one and two thousandths of an inch. Like it is. It's in. It's like I can't, it's another one of these spinner vases. Oh, and by wow. the way, not for nothing. I mean, this is this confirmed it for me. Is that is that that same mathematical relationships that we see with the golden ratio and pi? Also, the very same. It's the square root of six over two uh, radial uh, traversal pattern. We see that in multiple vases too. Oh my god! So the it's same design principle is in multiple artifacts. It's, it's not like an accident. It is. Yeah. It's very- is there any indication that there's like a reason for that? Because the only reason you do something like that is because it's super easy. You know, it's either so super easy or, or it's, it's super important. Or you it's need sacred. It, you need, I mean, or it's sacred. 
Yeah. But you know, you're not making 10,000. Do you need to make 10,000 sacred like wine well, jugs? Well, like, yeah, because they, they, they might be they might be producing like, cold stuff, you know? Like that's what I start thinking is you need like it's like a genie in a bottle shit, man. Like it yep. needs to be perfect in there. Well, it, what's interesting here is because you now you get into like what are they for? And I get this question a lot. It's like what are they are they vases? I don't think they're vases. I mean, look, I I I think they are something else potentially components of a bigger system. I think they were definitely inherited and used as vases by the Egyptians. I mean, that's no doubt. What, I mean, the I, th- ones I think that the Egyptians, pointy bottoms, the ones that don't have pointy bottoms. Right, yeah, there's ones that have to be have to have to basically have them upside down cuz cuz they don't uh yeah, they they won't stand on the, the the tip. Some of them balance on a on a tip perfectly. You saw the spinner vases like that. I, I actually think the Egyptians in a lot of cases drilled the holes through the handles. Uh, and there's lots. There's so so many of these vases that don't have um, holes through yes. the lug handles. Most of them, in fact, don't. Uh, and the holes that we do see drilled through the lug handles aren't very accurate. Like they, they definitely look like they're, they're fairly crudely made. Um, and that you would do that if you were putting string or metal through it to like hold it and hang it or something. And I think they were certainly used as vases. But I I think this is where we can do more study to look at like are there resonant properties to these things? What's the yeah. the volume of them? Uh, That's you what know, I was do, ask, do we yeah. see the same shapes scaling up and down? Just the 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 you know the form is the same. All of these are questions that are still yet to be answered. And I think it's, it's almost it's, like they could be a bunch of different components of those different because the pyramids seem like machines, you know. So those things yeah. could just be like a bunch of different. All the shit we're making out of metal, they were just it was just all granite, you know. Like uh, make a we need a triangle thing here with some lugs to tighten it on with, or you know, or it's even like all the five gallon pails well, you see yeah. around a job site from the painter, but it's just like they're all fucking. Ju- yeah. they, instead of making ten five gallon pails, you got ten granite jugs. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I mean, look at it. It looks like it looks like to me that the, the lug handles. You look at it this way; it's like a cam lock. You know, imagine sticking this in yeah, something, yeah. And turning it to lock it in. Like that's a, you know, and Chris Dunn describes in the Giza power plant like the, the Grand Gallery being filled of the full of these Heimholtz resonators, which varied in size. That, that were there to amplify some of these frequencies to to make that whole system work, and I, this is this is the exactly the sort of out of the box thinking and experimentation that I think we need to do because I you know I don't buy that all this shit is purely ceremonial. Nor the pyramids and all the sites themselves, the old kingdom sites, all the infrastructure that's under the ground and the channeled blocks and things. I, I think there was a functional purpose to them. I just I would love it if we would like you know seriously explore it and we'd have oh, yeah. some of our you know, I'll, I'll get all the data, have some actual serious tech. I'm not the guy to do it. Like I'm, you know, I can do a little bit of, of this stuff, but we need metrologists, engineers, experts in these different fields to come together, I think, and, and think about these problems. Chris Dunn's doing it. Um, you know, that's, I would, that's what I would hope we could get to with some of, maybe as the end result and end goal of some of this work is like, let's take another look at, some of these ancient sites and these ancient artifacts and consider them from a functional perspective. Are they, could they possibly have been used in some form of so for some function, at least as good as we know? Cause that's my other big point on all of this is like, we don't know everything yet, right? We're going to know more in 10 years and 20 years, a thousand years. Well, yeah. And just based on that, then you can safely say that, that there are realms of science and technology that are outside of our current understanding and I genuinely think that some of these answers might lay in those realms. They might be outside of our current perspective. And and there's endless examples of this throughout time. One of my favorite ones is, you know, taking an iPhone or or, or a cell phone back 50 or 100 or 1,000 years, have some powered off iPhone like this, and you'd show it to someone from those times, what are they going to say about it? Well, it's a, yeah. it's a shiny piece of glass or it's yeah. a shiny rock. Then yeah. And that's it. Like you just you look at it, okay, it doesn't do anything. It, but you and I, we couldn't make them, but we know what they are, right? Because we have the context of understanding touch screens and cameras and wireless network in the internet, like all of the things that we can look at this and say, this is a cell phone. I know what it does because I have all this contextual information to 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 say what this is. We we might be looking at some of this stuff and we just don't have the context to explain it. Right. I think it's a possible. I think it's a possibility. Oh, it's a hundred percent. I mean, I I don't know if you saw. I mean, I don't want how far to get into this, but so even if you measure the volume and see like any of the the sacred sort of volumetric dimensions, like a bath, you know, how many of yeah. those fit in the bath? I mean, wouldn't it be astounding if there was, you know, <laughs> you know, fourteen 
you know, 1400 or what would be, well, what would be the like 144 fit into a bath or some sacred number that yeah. is like, you know, the, there's a, there's a means to the volume on of it as well. And, and I don't so, know if you heard, you know, heard Malcolm talking about it uh, with the uh-huh. one that you could, you couldn't make that show, but he's talking to George and he's talking about the residence of time. Right. And yep. you and you and Kyle and Russ were talking about the 16 gigahertz and Kyle was kind of sort of ridiculing that though they would have had to know what a second mm-hmm. was and all that. But but when you hear Malcolm talk about it, and it's way over my head, so I can't even explain it. But when he yeah. when he brings time into it, it does it does make it really interesting. Like the way he explains it, Kyle, it, they they might know what a second is if they're using it, you know. And it might yep. there might be a resonance of time incorporated in the design. And if if he's showing at the same time that he's transmuting materials in there, I mean, maybe these are transmutation yeah. or purification vessels or. If if they're if they're made at, at a certain dimension, it could have a it could have like yep. what we would consider magic right now. Absolutely, like yeah. Look, the, and Ghostbusters. <laughs> yes, they were. Yeah, I look, the evil entities. Those were all the Pandora's boxes that they all fucking let out. Yeah, they might have let it all out, and that's that explains a few things. Um, but well, yeah, I light look, maybe they I, produce I, light. I I agree with all. I mean, I understand, and I kind of you know I've I've been following Malcolm's uh, technology with interest. Um, certainly the the practical kind of results that are coming out of it. And and the, I do understand the geometric kind of the sacred geometry element of it in terms of the angles of which it's it's creating these vortexes and things. Yeah, who knows? This These may display similar properties. I know Malcolm was interested in the volume of these things, and we've done some analysis on the volume, and there's been some interesting results that come out of it. Uh, I can tell you that. I know that Nick was looking at it for a while. And, I mean, something else that just came out, I think Matt Beal just did a, uh, an interview, I think, with Ralph Ellis, saying that these things and it's another sort of proof piece that these aren't fakes is that they actually reflect the ancient egyptian system of measurement they're made in round like actually like the the height and the dimensions of these things match um the system of measurement that they were they know what they were using back then which they may well have inherited because that system of measurement also connects to our system of measurement the mile and and it, it has all of this geodetic information encoded in it that's related to the you know the dimension of the planet and all this sort of stuff uh, so there's some really new, interesting information coming out about these. But, yeah, that's exactly the kind of, I think, extrapolation and investigation that we should be doing on these things to see how, it, what are the possible functional applications. And maybe by by going down those paths, we might even learn something. You know, that that's oh, yeah, the kind that, of thing that might reveal new information, new ways of doing things, new science. Yeah, it makes me want to learn sacred geometry more than ever. Like having you present this information and realizing this pattern, I mean, it makes me want to learn go through Randall's courses of sacred geometry mm-hmm. really and go deep into it because now we're seeing Malcolm stuff and your work on this and it, it all feels like it's got a, there's a reason why they're using these sort of natural numbers. These then, I mean, it could even be sort of made from a natural process. Like maybe it's the result of some sort of process that's, that's creating this. Yeah. You know? there, yeah. There's some basis. There's definitely seems to be an organized design principle behind it. You know, whether that's based on the use of the one radian arc. So we see that as well. We see like that's a geometric principle, like a radian, um, which is the angle, you know, radian. If you take the radius of a circle and you stick it on the circumference and the ang- you cut that piece of pie out, that that angle can be described as a single radian. Like it's an elegant way of describing angles, but it's this, you know, fundamental geometry, uh, circular geometry. You mentioned the 16 gigahertz thing before, like that that base unit that I talked about that Mark derived. Uh, from this also just so happens to match you know almost exactly within two microns the wavelength of a 16 gigahertz electromagnetic wave in a, traveling in a vacuum which has some correlation to the spiel all these other correlates that's an interesting number that 16 gigahertz number that we we kind of use it today in satellite technology and communications but yeah there's i think there's a lot of different avenues for investigation and and further work um uh, on these vases and i'm yeah i'm i'm, I'm watching it with interest i hope i hope it continues to happen like that's i'll be keep reporting on it as much as i can um but yeah i i you know i, I don't i just don't like the approach that a lot of people are taking just either poo-pooing it oh, these are just ceremonially they were just made by egyptians who tried really hard they rubbed on them with sticks for a really long time and they just made it. i mean just it's nonsense well i mean this this is going to open up the the avenue of measuring those granite statues that you've you showed us in yep. egypt the boxes. you know even maybe even the boxes like how, what's the volume of those boxes on Elephantine Island and how accurate those are made? Like it's it, whether it's a, you know, what, whatever machine it is. I mean, it seems to me like it all sort of may, it's all the same thing. Like somebody's, somebody's yeah. like accurately 
and precisely making these granite things like the Serapian boxes and those. I mean, what's the volume of those boxes? Um, we don't know on Elephantine Island. Like it, it's don't know. No one scanned them. You know, no one's looked at them beyond. I mean, even in the Serapium, you, I think we've got measurement data from Mariette for like one or two of them, and these are rough kind of measurement data. It's not. Nobody's. It's. It blows my mind that nobody's done that. Like it people, wouldn't take pe- long. It, people seem to think that the 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 box in the great in the great pyramid in the king's chamber has got a sacred uh, volume to it. Yeah, one point five by two, whatever the one point five by two point five by. Well, the chamber five, itself is whatever. Is a double cube. The chamber chamber itself has all these sort of uh, incredible sacred geometry principles encoded in it, um, as shown by a number of people. I mean, Patrice Poyard with. Um, uh, revelation of the pyramids also the the builders of the ancient mysteries he gets into it yeah and the box itself is is super interesting from that aspect as well it's just yeah it kind of blows my mind that we we just haven't doesn't doesn't seem to be much interest in investigating these aspects of these artifacts i mean it, it can't hurt to, to to know more about them and it seems like a great opportunity for a collaboration between say an engineering department and an archaeology department of a university let's you know right let's, what let's, yeah why aren't they doing this stuff i don't know well, I mean, I mean it's box the don't potential for the door either or the lid. I mean, like, can we yeah, show some pictures? Maybe we should show some pictures here if 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 we could. I mean, we've I mean, it might be too late, but I mean, I could I can probably pull you. up some of our uh, pictures from our Egypt trip too. But you should definitely like, should. Yeah, uh, it's you know, a good time. The boxes. I don't have my second screen here. Have you been watching Jeff Drum stuff at all, Ben? Not really. A little bit. I I do know about it though. The land of Kim. Yeah, yeah. I think he's living out there now. I think I believe he's in Egypt. Yep, that's what Yusuf tells me. Yeah, I think uh, I don't, I don't know if it's the chemical that. thing, but man, that's yeah, definitely that's the impression I got wandering around in them things is they were doing something in there that wasn't like hanging out. So this is like the box. Like, can you guys see the screen here? Yep, yep, yep. So this yep. is the box in the back here. You see that thing in the back? This is a temple think, of Edfu? Yeah. Yeah. Now I think that box there is like. Obviously, it's sacred. I mean, they. I think that this I whole temple might. I don't see the full screen. I'm on just. Yeah, we the, can only just see your uh, what? explorer window. Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. Okay. I do have pictures of that box. I think those. You got my I pictures from that. when they let me in there. I think I was the only one that got no, let in there. No, that no, day. that's my picture. That's my picture. I well, no, I went in there as well. Like in the. Oh, did, oh, did yeah, you get yeah. into that chamber? It's the same box. Yeah. It's it's the box that's in the holiest of holies at the temple of. Uh, Horus at Edfu. That's the same box that's on Elephantine Island, and we know there's destroyed boxes there as well. It's like this weird shrine-looking thing with the bullnose around it. Very, very precisely made. Yeah, this isn't working for me. I've got only one screen, and I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not too sure. Boxes. Okay, here, here we go. Uh, now, can you see the full thing? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. yeah. So, I mean, look at that. This, I mean, I love the glare off this, right? Mm-hmm. But to me, that's the same box that we saw scattered on Elephantine Island. There's a whole bunch of them that aren't hundred percent. Like, Sitting in a temple is. like this, I mean, it very it might not be exact same, but very very similar, it's very close. But the, it's but it's the, basically it is. I think it, I would be surprised if it wasn't exactly the same. Yeah, I bet yeah, you they're but, identical. Yeah, this one's been marked up. You can see it's actually been damaged. It's been written all over, and it's it's yeah. had some damage to it from whatever reason. Um, it's got hieroglyphs on it. All the examples we see at Elfton Island are completely bare. There's no. Can you see this on one too now? Can you see a different one now? Nope. No, no. I had that was the day I had COVID. I missed that one. <laughs> Come on, stayed on the boat. That was a boat day, right? I stayed on the boat. Yeah, it's not a bad day. I didn't day leave the room. Though. I was like sleeping. And uh, I think I had COVID. I'm sure COVID was going around. No, uh, it was 100. Yeah. percent How's the, uh, this one? Around. Can you see this one here? That's yep. just a different. That's yep, just yep. a different. Uh, yeah, I mean, and then so let me just pull one up from when I, I got one of you standing around this box here. Let's let's pull this up here. I should have put these into this. Why does it keep pulling up the wrong one there? Let's see. It's a real shame. Or are you going back? Are you going back next month too, Ben? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to be there for six weeks. Six weeks straight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're doing two that? tours. We had to. We had to. We were. We were doing one tour, and then we were going to do a uh, Lebanon extension. And you know, Lebanon obviously is not the best idea. So. Uh, we canceled that and ended up. I had we had like 170 people on a wait list, so we we decided to run a second tour in early March. So we're basically doing a, a tour and then taking a break for a couple of weeks and then doing another tour. So this we'll is the one here. Yeah, this that's Elephantine Island. 
So this yeah, same, is ben, same that's ben himself right there. And he just like <laughs> look, looking at this box and there's like a couple of them, different granite, different yep. types of granite. There's three basically. There's at least three there that we there's know of that were on there, that site yeah. that were broken up. That's the complete one. It has that really interesting bull nose on the back that I that that, that is this smoking. I think it's smoking gun evidence for machining on its own. Like the fact that it has those, it's been planed. It has those um, flat the, surfaces on half of the bull nose that it wasn't finished. Yeah, so it's that the benefit of unfinished work. Yeah, this is it. This is looking at another one of these broken boxes that was being quarried. In fact, the you can't see it. You can kind of see in the top of that picture. They see some red ochre paint right on the top there. You can that that box. They were drawing an outline of like a figure, and they were going to cut that box up and take that top slab and use it for something else, which is very common practice in ancient Egypt. I mean, even the the dream stele, this famous plinth that sits between the paws of the sphinx with all the engraving on it i mean that's a recycled piece of granite from an older structure and there's yep. another sort of picture of the inside, inside. of it and how accurate it is i mean it's beautiful it's- it, it has tube drills in the ends of the of those like those ledges as well on tops and bottom yeah yeah it's that's a that's a really cool piece i love showing people that thing it's 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 amazing Hey Ben, I wanted to show you this. Have you uh, have you heard of the ethical skeptic at all? Have you followed him? The ethical skeptic? I can't say I have. One more, big... one more, one more share, share screen here, Darren, just to get a, a, a wide view of this. So uh, that's the that's a picture of the box lying down there. Yeah, that's its bottom. And some of the other stuff, the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, and then has that pyramidian type top on yeah. the other side. I'm sure it's the same as the one in Elfi. Uh, where in, I don't yeah, think that's Edfu. Yeah, yeah. Edfu. Edfu. Temple of Horus. I had the Koof when everyone went to Edfu. You had the Koof. (laughs) People get the Uh, Koof. It happens. It happens, uh, you know. It goes around. It comes around. I wanted to just show this to you. I mean, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but uh, it's basically it all sort of boils down to he's a skeptic, you know, but a good skeptic. So far, he's coming on the show tomorrow. So far, we talked to him about some other stuff and this article, he doesn't buy the mainstream narrative at all. Mm-hmm. He thinks it's a lot older than it is. Um, but he sort of just gets into this band here. And I want to know if anyone's ever run this by it. Because I think when we were there with Yusuf, he was kind of talking about that sort of as high as they got excavating stuff, right? Or stealing it or whatever. Um, it yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting band. That's an interesting perspective. I, so to my pictures to see if that band is really like that. I don't know if it's been in, enhanced a little bit. Maybe I um, think he has enhanced a little bit. Maybe in that picture. Maybe no, there. I saw one of Ben's recently, and Ben, I, I was shocked when I saw yours, and I was like, "Well, there it is, right there, too." So, oh, is it? So his whole thing is that it's just it's it's from seawater. It's from that yeah. that line where the sea was for a little while. Jesus, I, I can't remember if he got into exactly how high the water would have had to have been. A long way up, man. Yeah, but that's, that's why that pyramid in particular is at the highest point on the plateau. Yeah, and that's like it, why we don't see those markings on the other pyramids because they were uh, submerged <sighs> completely almost. That's a big way. I mean, it's it is an interesting um observation. I and I <clears throat> I'm not um I'll have to check this out, but I'm not I'm not All opposed right. to the idea of floods on the plateau. I, I do think some of the erosion that we see and I kind of talked a little bit about it in my last video. I've got another video on erosion coming up uh, soon. I do think some of the erosion we see in places like the Mortuary Temple, the areas around that that pyramid in particular, uh, may well be from water. Um, it, that's it's it's tough to kind of look at that a lot of that erosion and say, well, this is wind and sand. It certainly doesn't match the other, you know, Fourth Dynasty erosion that we see from the small block structures that are, that are dated in the standard model to the same time period uh the the big megalithic stuff that is made up of blocks up to i think you know 450 tons and more that stuff is super heavily eroded really badly and and you know I, i've done a talk with randall where he talked about you know there's been lots of studies done on limestone erosion rates and and even in areas like you know sea sea fronts like wave action hitting wall you're still talking tens of thousands of years to get to that level of erosion so some of it may well be. I mean, it's a possibility. I mean, Petrie himself found evidence for 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 just gigantic floods th- throughout the Nile Valley. I mean, you took you know way up high on the edges of of the Nile Valley, he found evidence for water and and flooding. Um, and we know that there's been events that may well have have happened in the past that did that. One 
that I always like to mention is probably Burkle, Burkle Crater, which is only, I think, I think that may be the source for the biblical flood because that was an impact into the Indian Ocean 5,000 years ago, right about the time that you would have maybe been writing the Old Testament, so 2000 to 3000 BC, when this thing plopped down into the Indian Ocean, created this giant crater, but it, and it formed these you know, 900 foot high tsunamis that, that, that hit Madagascar and Western Australia, and you can still see the evidence for them when you look at it on Google, uh, Google Earth. You see these giant chevrons from these waves that washed miles inland. But that same shockwave and, and, and water would have gone north into the Persian Gulf and right up through into the uh, potentially into the Nile Valley um, and flooded that whole area, which is obviously the source for all those, those old books we all like to um, put so much stock into. Um, that's where they're all written. So, it, you know, there's, there's, these things have happened, and, and we know that that, I mean, Burkle Crater was nothing compared to like the Younger Dryas or the Elder Dryas or the Bolling Allerod period. Uh, yeah, who knows? It and I, to I explain like all the sand too, you know what I mean? Like for some reason, when I see a bunch of sand like that, I think water. I don't know why. I'm not a geologist. <laughs> I could be totally ass backward, but <laughs> it just seems like the only thing that can make that shit that fine is, is water. Desertification. I'm not that familiar with the process of like how desert sands grow. I mean, beach sands a little different, given I think a lot of it's like ground up coral from wave action. But then, then actual desert sand. I mean, it's quartz and mica and and uh, hard minerals that are. I don't know quite how it's formed to get to that point either, and how you get so much of it, like what we see in Egypt, because we know that area wasn't always like that, right? That's you know nine thousand years ago. That was green. You know that was the, the Sahara wasn't the Sahara Desert; it was something else. And so, so there's a lot of erosion on the Temple of the Sphinx too in there, oh, and, and dude, also it, the Temple between the pyramids, like that. That those mega. Th- I, I, mean, I saw you your your video recently about the yeah. when you were talking to Yusuf about the big blocks on the Giza Plateau, and, and mm-hmm. it does seem like that maybe his theory explains some of that uh, that massive stuff, and then maybe the newer stuff. The newer stuff was put on later with less erosion, right? I mean, I, yeah. So the, I, I, the erosion I think pattern on the megalithic stuff, like if you could separate out based on erosion, you know. Yes, I, absolutely. In fact, I'm doing a video based on that. So, so you you have to think. Remember, in the standard model, uh, all of that structure, all of that structure, like the 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 the, the mortuary temple, the valley temple, you know, the causeway itself, the pyramids, they're all dated to the fourth dynasty. So, old kingdom, fourth dynasty whatever, 2,500, 2,700 BC, 2,800 BC. But around that, the Giza Plateau has much more than just those pyramids. There are structures all over the place. And a lot of them, a lot of those structures are also dated to the exact same period, same people, same material. It's limestone, came from the same place. We know it's the same stone. Made from smaller blocks, very well made in a lot of cases. But it doesn't show anything like the erosion that we see on the megalithic stuff where you're talking a couple hundred tons plus with these blocks. It's a, it's a vastly different degree of erosion i mean not only that but many of these massive megalithic structures with this limestone that's eroded they were cased in granite like they had that granite casing inside and out all around the it, which, at which, karnak which, are crazy remember those three at karnak yeah yeah i mean those some of like the, i mean most eroded shit that i think we've seen the <laughs> whole time it was, it yep. was just like three blocks they're mostly buried there's like you know a couple apart. feet of each of them sticking and there's nothing left of them yeah, they're, they're literally falling apart. You can pull the material apart. Like it's super heavily eroded. Yeah, there's a few places like that that are, it's almost like some transformations happen to the stone. Like it's, something's occurred to it as an effect or a consequence of something else. I, yeah, they're very hard to explain. But just at Giza, if you just, if you just compare the fourth dynasty structures that, that are made from smaller blocks, that can, you know, and remember they're all supposedly made by the same people, same time, same material. They don't show anything like the erosion you see on the megalithic stuff. Oh, that's interesting. And the megalithic stuff was cased in granite, which would have been protective. Like it would have protected the limestone from, you know, thousands, potentially thousands of years of erosion, wind and sand and all these things. But yet what we see from those is these inner limestone core blocks from these structures that are you know, hundreds of tons. They're super, super heavily eroded. And the other limestone structures that never had casing stones on them, they're fine. Like they're literally, they're still standing. They're fine. They weren't. So, because some people say, "Oh, you know, they built with these big blocks because they didn't want it to fall down in an earthquake." Well, there's a, these other structures are still there; they also didn't fall down in the earthquakes. Yeah, but there's a there's a massive degree of difference in the erosional um, profile of these structures, and that's a 
like I said, I'm working on a, it's probably going to be the video I do next after this Gun and Padang video. I'm going to, I'm going to be diving because Yusuf and I spent a couple of days recently. It was just us out there looking at this and him talking and I was recording and we were getting into it because he's been making these observations for a while. And it was nice to put it all together because even you, we even like do things like look at structures that are at the exact same elevation profile. Say the mortuary temple in front of the middle pyramid, there's a structure that's just behind the great pyramid at exactly the same height, made from the same material, but it's made from smaller blocks. Well made, definitely fourth dynasty, I think. And it's certainly attributed to the fourth dynasty, but it's just, it's in far, far better shape than the megalithic stuff that supposedly comes from the same time period. I don't know how you explain it. Uh, Yeah. Okay, fourth dynasty. Yeah, I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm glad you asked that, Darren. I was gonna. I was thinking maybe we should talk to Ben about that before we 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 talk to him. What Karnak? No. I mean, that's yeah. There's some stuff at Karnak. I mean, I talked. To, I I did look at those blocks and talk about. I did a video recently on Karnak and Luxor, and that that uh, that granite is like we Chuck Kinzer was there, right? He was he's a geologist who 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 actually said, look, this wouldn't happen inside of ten thousand years, and then you said fifty fifty thousand years, and he wasn't going to commit to that, but he said for sure not within ten thousand years, and I think he was. You know, uh, that's very conservative. I, I think it, it. You're talking more, you know, fifty thousand years maybe for some of that stuff. But who knows how old it is? You, you just don't know. There's, there's. When you see that level of of erosion on, in material like granite, I mean, that stuff doesn't happen overnight. It literally looks like granite. Like one one of these trips, we went out to the. We were at the Red Sea, and we went out like on quads in the desert, and there's these giant granite outcrops out out on the Red Sea. In the, I guess this would be the Eastern Desert. Um, in uh, in Egypt, and you know, there's these big granite outcroppings, and it the material like this has been exposed for millions of years, and the material was essentially looked and felt the same as those blocks at Karnak, the granite. It's like, wow, the hell is this? And these blocks of granite at Karnak were definitely cut, originally definitely cut and shaped. They had sharp edges and corners. They still had a bow tie join between them. They still had that, right, right. You know, they were you could see how they'd been form they're not natural yeah they were rectangular here's that here's that the two holes you're talking about at the end of that uh, yeah well there's there, you know? two on the other side as well but yeah, yeah. there's they're yeah those are really cool like that's a challenge on its own just cutting those holes so close to those edges right it's it's you have to have an offset drill bit or be doing oh, something right. clever to to cut those things you try you know get it oh, you yeah. know if if the if the tool is wider than the tool bit it's tough to get it straight you know <laughs> yeah yeah there's you can't go you can't go you know, further past this because you're stuck. You're stuck in that little. Uh, you're stuck in that box there. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you plan for us at the eclipse here? And just, I guess it's only like three and a half months away. Yeah. To, uh, no, as soon as I get back from Egypt. Yeah. The the uh, the eclipse event. I'm very much looking forward to. That. Well, for starters, I'm planning on driving. I'm going to drive over. I'm going to camp in my car. I don't want to. Wanna, I don't want to fly with just no camping gear. But I'm uh, the presentation. I'm, I want to talk about is probably going to be. Um, some of the I want to cover some of the new discoveries. I may not do vases. I think mean, I did vases in my last couple of presentations, uh, and people probably heard enough about vases from me. Uh, I would love to get into Gun and Padang. Uh, the labyrinth is another big topic for me that I wanted to get into this year in some of these talks, like the the lost labyrinth of Egypt that we discovered, but nobody wants to do anything about, and the whole story was suppressed by Zahi Was and the Supreme Council of Antiquities. When it was all found, but that's that's like, I think the more people should know about the labyrinth because it's quite literally one of the lost wonders of the ancient world that has been described by guys like Herodotus or Diodorus Siculus or Pliny the Elder, these ancient historians, as you know, surpassing the pyramids in grandeur and size as being a more significant achievement. And you think about how famous the Great Pyramid is and how much attention is paid to that thing. Yet there's something that's better than that, that, you know, considered to be more spectacular and a, a higher level of achievement that's buried in the sand of Egypt right now. But we we also know where it is. We found it, and uh, it was confirmed that it's there. And then it just that whole story that that team that did that work that got that got suppressed and swept under the rug, and and there's nothing happening about it other than it's you know it's drowning in groundwater right now. Uh, I think that's that would be. You know that's an interesting topic, like that the, the history that the labyrinth has played throughout time and and history as well. Like it's it's a very well known structure uh, in ancient times, and there's many historical accounts of these guys from you know Greeks and Romans who visited it, and then at some point between then and now it got lost. Like it was just like whatever the dark. It, at some point, 
we we lost track of it and we don't Where's know where that it was. that again? It's Where's at Hawara. It's in Egypt. Hawara. It's at this it's it's literally at this site called Hawara where there's a pyramid. It's a mud brick pyramid that sits on top. There's big fields of sand where you can see people have been digging. Uh Flinders Petrie found it originally. Well, he thought he he, he found the roof. He, he he dug down like 9 10 meters and he found these giant granite blocks and he's like ah, I found the foundation for the labyrinth. I I found like what where it was standing and it's clearly all been quarried and carried away, but little did he know he was likely standing on its roof. And this was later confirmed by um, an expedition called the Matahar expedition. And I'm going to get my dates wrong here. I feel like it was 2014 or 15. A guy named Louis de Cordier, uh, who was like a, a, I guess an entrepreneur. He's the guy who put the, the team together and financed it. And he went out, and got and worked with the Egyptians, worked with the Council of Antiquities, and he got permission to go out there and do like ground penetrating radar and other seismic um, techniques to study the ground and 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 sort of image the subsurface around that pyramid at Hawara and the canal that runs today runs through it. And he found it. I mean, he found he literally found it. I've got I've got his paper and his results. Uh, it's hard, you know. It's kind of buried in the internet. It's wait. You need to go to the archi- internet archive to find this stuff today, but. Uh, he found gonna, it. Are you going to get into, you know, the mythology around that too? Not just like, no, not just like yeah. stuff because there's, I mean, you wonder, it, it kind of makes sense. They were talking about Hades and Sheol and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and the underworld and all that. I mean, if there's, if well, there's literally underworld labyrinths everywhere, I mean, no wonder this, why people, no wonder why it's so strong in mythology. And this one's like, you think of it like a couple dozen football fields and two levels. Like it's something 3000 chambers with these giant halls. And rooms dedicated that at the time were dedicated to gods, and you needed a guide to go through there. It's the, it, it's literally the inspiration and source for the Minoan labyrinth the Minotaur, the Minotaur, the Minotaur the right? Labyrinth, yeah. Holy. Story goes, yeah. Somebody from Crete came back, or the king or whatever had visited this labyrinth. He came back and said, "Make me one of these. Like, make me a, <laughs> make me a small version of this." And that's the source for the the Minotaur and the Minoan labyrinth on Crete. And that's that comes from basically the Egyptian labyrinth, which turns out is not just some fantasy people actually visited it we have their accounts um yeah it's just you, you literally could get lost in it it's that's how big it is and it's and it's you know one of these guys described it as having a single slab as the ceiling which you can think of i mean i don't think it was a single slab but i think you're probably describing that typical kind of precision uh fit granite granite stone that that just these big blocks of it but they probably so precisely fit kind of like the valley temple fit together where you couldn't see the seams in it when you were standing in it, but it had these giant halls and multiple levels and you needed guides. And I mean, it, it's it, the stories of it are, are, are crazy from, from there, antiquity. Is there, is there a uh, sort of a sacredness to Hawara? Is there anything specific about that, uh, that spot as well? Besides that, there's a bunch of mystery in Hawara. The pyramid itself is interesting. I mean, it's well, what's beneath the pyramid is interesting. So the the, the labyrinth, I think, is beneath it. But then there's other. Str- there's also the labyrinth's quite deep. Um, you know, I think the right now and it, the Petrie has an account of him penetrating the 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 megalithic construction beneath the pyramid, and this has this giant box made from yellow um, yellow uh, calcite. The big single piece box is like a hundred tons or something that's down there, and he at that time had to like to he was trying to plumb it and figure out and measure it, and he had to stick his head under the water because the groundwater at that time was in the bottom chamber, <laughs> much lower than it is today, and that that's the problem on this site today. I think it's also the, I do think it's it's the reason I don't think there was a conspiracy so much to cover up the site. I think it was more it's more got to do with uh, politics and just um, just I guess the economic situation in Egypt because. What's happened since that time, and certainly since they built the high dam, which was the 1960s, uh, on the on the on the River Nile, and the groundwater's been rising. Right, this is this is this has had a consequence to all of these ancient sites. So since they they dammed the Nile, they were able to regulate the flow of water to the north, um, to northern to basically it's the 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 dams down near Sudan and, um. And uh, the, the, it, it regulates the flow of water to the north. And that, uh, for starters, re- it got rid of the inundation, which is people, it's kind of counter counterintuitive. People think that, oh, if there's no inundation, then how come the water table's rising? Well, what it also got rid of was the dry season. So the inundation would happen for three months of the year. 
and the rest of the year would have much less water in the Nile, and that that would then cause the the ground the 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 water table level to drop. So now, because they don't have that dry season where the water table drops, the overall effect is the water table's been rising. So you can't get anywhere near this chamber that Petrie explored anymore because the water table at, at Hawar is about, about five metres uh, below the ground. And then the labyrinth is said to start at about nine or 10 metres below the ground. So it's, you know, it's five metres below the water table level now. And you can see that. I've actually been down into, there's a passage at the pyramid where it's like a descending passage. You just walk a few steps down there. It's just water and rocks and you just throw a rock and plop, it's, it's full of water. So, um yeah, that's the that's the challenge there. And you, you get there's bits and pieces. There's a little open air museum there. You see, similar to like Tanis and and some of these other places at Carnegie, you've got fragments of columns, all of these big granite works. A lot of the stuff may have come from the labyrinth or other structures around it. And I think all of that stuff was there at some point. And then the Egyptians came along and say the 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 middle or new kingdom and built that mud brick pyramid, probably the middle kingdom, and built that mud brick pyramid that's on top of it. Um, which is fi- a fine construction. It's, it's eroding, and we know how they did all that stuff. Uh, they even draw scenes on the wall of them making mud bricks um, for pyramids and things, and they built that thing on top of it, maybe to mark it. I don't know. But, yeah, there's there's all this megalithic stuff below the ground, and then you've got this mud brick pyramid on top. And other than that, it's just desert, and there's a little open air museum. Very few people go to the site. Uh, there isn't a whole lot to see. I can't remember if we went out there. Don't think no, we I don't did. think I don't think we did. Yeah. I used to take people out there, but it's just not, it's a bit it's of a trek boring. and there's really not much to see other than telling people about the labyrinth, you know? Right. Yeah. You're like, hey, below the, it's really interesting stuff here, but you can't get to it. So this is one where you're going to do more research on, you know, on, on the internet compared to like, yeah, yeah. Going there, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, Ben, this has been fantastic as always. I, can, I hope you guys have a blast in Egypt. I can't wait to hang out with you guys again in April. It's coming up quick. Uh, it's gonna be fun, man. September, we'll get to hang out a few times again this year. Life is good. Can't complain. Try and get Work. some measurements of those boxes. I mean, uh, I I'm trying every time. I, I, yeah, it's tough. It's, it's got to open up for uh, some inspection. You know, bring a little. I, you need I'm working on it. Measurers, dude. You just. I, I've I've made some inquiries to see what it would take. Like I don't think I would stand a chance. I think you need to be an educational institution to and someone involved in ongoing archaeological work to do that stuff. Uh, I, but maybe we can. I can. I, I am trying to figure out a way to get that done. I think it's possible, and it, it wouldn't hurt anyone. But yeah, we should. Yeah, I'll try and do that. But we should tell people about that um, eclipse at the canyon event, right? It's um, there's an event bright page out there that does it. We'll be there. Gramerica will be there. Russ and Russ and Kyle Snake Bros, David Matheson, who else? Luke Cavins. Um, three day what? Three nights camping. It's the total, the totality of the eclipse is, is running right over mid Texas and Utopia during the time. So we'll be out there camping. It's music festival, $50 dinner still be playing. We'll have some stand up comedy, basically three day festival celebrating this celestial uh, event and having some cool lectures and music and just hanging out together. It's going to be a good time. It'd be amazing. It's the eclipse festival of a lifetime. I mean, you'd be a real yeah. sucker to miss it. I mean, no, don't. You're going to be like, God damn, I can't believe it. We'd be like Woodstock. People that miss wisdom, yeah. like, ah, you don't want to be that guy. You just go to contact at the cabin.com, go to the menu at the top, click on Clips the Canyon, boom, there you go. Well, have a note, there's a link in the show notes. You know, cool. get yourself on the list. It's going to go quick. You know, there's lots of spots left now. People are going to panic. Here's the thing yep. is there's going to be a spot where just regular people who don't even like listen to our shows can't find anything to do for the eclipse and they're going to just come across it that way. So better to get it now than to wait. Contact at thecabin.com. What about everything else, Ben? Where can people, like, what if they want to get on the wait list for Egypt or where can they do your there YouTube? Are still, there are still a couple spots for the the tours coming up if people are interested. They they filled up and then a couple of people pulled out, so there's some spots available. But, yeah, you get me at unchartedx.com. All the links to my tours uh, are up there. They've got a link to my YouTube channel. I'm also on Rumble. I'm streaming right now live on Twitch, as I do, and then I am also streaming at least once a week over on, on Rumble. Uh, but all of those details, I mean, my social media, all that stuff is linked on the website, unchartedx.com. It's probably the best place to uh, to get me. Thanks, buddy. You're doing a great job communicating about all those vases. I mean, honestly, it's fantastic to watch your work. So keep Thank it you, up. Graham. I appreciate it, man. Thanks, yeah. thanks for the invite. The dude. I mean, it's an honor to know you. You're becoming the like go-to. <laughs> you and the bros are becoming the go-to Egypt guys. It's crazy. You'll have to let us know when you're doing South America too because I haven't yes. been there yet, so that might be something I want to jump on. 
Yeah, for sure. We probably 25. I'm going to get down there for a preview trip this year and iron some stuff out and make sure it'll work. And then I think I, I would like, I got a lot of people like, when are you doing South America? I'd love to put it something together for maybe 2025. Just just crawl into that granite box. You've got enough time on Elephantine <laughs> Island and just start doing some internal no, 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 measurements no, 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 there. I just it. really want to see what the Do measurements what I can. are. Send someone out so that they get kicked out of Egypt, though. You can't. Yeah, no, they won't get kicked out of Egypt for doing it's that. But we'll, like, maybe okay, we'll bring a tight measure and try it off. But you got to do some sketchy shit. Like Marty would have done it for free. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, there's it's always some Marty. people. Trust me. There's I got guys who are like, I'm gonna bring a, I'm gonna bring a like a light ask. I'm gonna bring a scanner. I'm like, ah, you could try, but I, yeah, it's not. Like, Everything's illegal. They, can't do it. They but, seen my you know, mustache yeah. and they were searching me on the way into the country. Like, <laughs> you got drugs, don't you? I was like, no, man. Well, yeah. Like, what about cigarettes? I was like, I don't smoke. And then he's like, empty your pockets. And I got a lighter. He's like, what do you got a lighter for? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm a survivalist. Fuck off. <laughs> well, man, amazing as always. Thanks, Thanks for man. coming on the show and uh, come back anytime, sir. It's a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Ciao for now. Cheers. And that was a chat. Friend of the show, Ben Van Kirkwood from Uncharted um. X. What'd you think, buddy? Oh, yeah, I love it. It's exciting times. It really is. It's moving fast. It's amazing. It's amazing yeah. stuff. You know. Check out his work. Check out those vases. Make one yourself, Darren. You get to download one of those STLs and make Dude, one. Dude, I didn't even think about 3D printing them. I'll 3D print some, I'll 3D print, uh, some Egyptian vases. I'll start doing experiments for you. What kind? You're like, oh, you yeah. have baths? You'll do 108 <laughs> bottles of bath water? <laughs> exactly. Big thanks to Ben for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks, guys. Hey, if you're one of the few people who do support, just support our work, you know. We do all these shows for free. I think this is, you know, probably coming up on 650, 640 shows, all there, all for free. Um, You know, just have them. If they add some value to your life, to your commute, to whatever you're listening, edwardgramerica.ca slash support today. Sign up for monthly or make a one-time donation. We're fully demonetized on YouTube now, so that don't help. Of course, you can head over to GrimeAmericaOutlaw.ca if you want to check out our other podcast or contact at thecabin.com is where we have that eclipse trip and all the other trips we do. And AdultBrain.ca, we got over well over 100 audiobooks now in that podcast feed that you can get. Uh, free books changing all the time, so it's a great place to be hanging out. And, uh, of course, I got to say, if you're tuned in live now, we're going to be back in like 10 minutes here. Five to 10 minutes. No, we'll what? Up. What? No, 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 no. No, we're not doing that? No, no, no. Like an hour, an hour and a half maybe? For what? For the next show? For the roundup? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for listening, we'll guys. And we maybe, will see Maybe in 15 week. minutes. We could try. <laughs> Take a look at the big old smile on my face Kicking around down by the pool of narcissists The people are many, they preen themselves Oh, how they navel gaze Somewhere over that hill, the gloomy skies cease to exist I'm climbing that hill, I pass by and pity the poor Sisyphus I go into hyperdrive, turn into a beam of light I'm strolling down a static electric avenue The people are predictable, they say good morning, how do you do? When out of nowhere, a randomly pure angel in the crosswalk bumps into me And in doing so, knocks all the evil and all the wind out of me And it's black as tar, ugly as ever, and of no apology This angelic mama sings heavenly of the truest theology Together we're a seraphim dream Forever young with no chronology a thousand years from now will be written into ancient mythology We go into hyperdrive and turn into a beam of light Can you tell me about the view up there? It's sparkling remarkably, the air is crystal clear 
Well, please won't you tell me what it takes to transcend this place? A little bit of heart and a whole lot of soul. Take a look at the big old smile on my face. As my angel says, dance with me and your life will never, ever, ever be told. I go into hyperdrive, turn into a beam of light. 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 What? <laughs>